Stanford University. Well, I appreciate everybody being here. We're going to get started and we're going to talk a little bit about one of our biggest problems, which is obesity. I think everybody can hear me at this point. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. I think everybody knows it's a big problem, one that's getting worse. And if you look around the country, about 60% of this country is either overweight or obese. And probably the biggest thing of concern is, even though that's a very large number, it may actually get bigger. Because take a look at that bottom bullet point there. 75% of obese kids grow up to be obese adults. Biggest risk factor? tend to be obese parents. So if we think things are bad now, things may actually get worse over time. People often ask, you know, what causes obesity? And you can see there it's a very long laundry list. If you want to really sum it up, it's really, you know, essentially one concept. It's ancient genes and modern environment. In the old days, being able to hold on to your calories was a good thing, you know, when we didn't have a lot of food around. Now in the modern environment where you have so much food available, not so good because we really cling to every last calorie. The other thing that's going on is that we know the physical activity has declined. And believe it or not, sleep may play a role too. And you may know this. If you don't sleep a lot, the next day when you get up, where do you get your energy from? A cup of coffee or more food? So all of those things come into play. Now take a look here. You can see what happens when you look at the consumption of different sweeteners that are existing in different drinks and food. And you can see this correlates to something called triglycerides, which is a type of cholesterol. And you can see here, as you have more and more uh, cholesterol, as you have more and more sweetener, your cholesterol goes up as well. The other thing that I, as I mentioned before, was diet and exercise. Now, way back in the 1960s, roughly about 40% of kids either walked or biked to school. And you can see down here now where we're at in terms of who's walking, it's almost 10% enormous decline, so much less physical activity going on. Now the other thing here that you want to take a look at is when it comes to diet, the composition of what we eat has changed to some degree, but it's really changed in two specific areas, and I'll show you right here. The big places things have changed over time are soft drinks, excuse me, soft drinks and fruit drinks. You see that? Almost all of the other ones, you can take a look here, french fries, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, pizza, Mexican food, you know, you look at it over time, they're relatively, believe it or not, stable. Now, the big place where you see an explosion, though, is along those soft drinks and fruit drinks. Our bodies don't know when to stop when it comes to liquids. You've got to be very careful with liquids. Those big bente latte mochaccinos that people have have a ton of calories in them, and it goes down very easily. In fact, you can't even get, you know, a small cup of coffee anymore at, um, at Starbucks. There's no more talls. I don't know if people heard that. So that's the place where we're at. I like to put up this one slide. It's a very famous picture, of course. It's The Last Supper by Da Vinci. And you can see there that uh, this is probably the most famous painting around eating or having a meal. And what's interesting is that some researchers from Cornell took a look at the painting over time. And what they found is the portions in the paintings got bigger over time. So when they redid this painting over and over again, the corresponding meal got bigger. And you can see that. And you wonder, well, how do they know it got bigger? Well, they correlated to the size of the uh, disciples' heads. And so they were able to see that the portions actually got bigger. So we're not only having bigger portions in real life, but also in art over time. Show you that, you know, this is sometimes people ask, you know, what are some other influences? And the economy, believe it or not, is, is one as well. People talk about a concept of food insecurity. Uh, when you don't know where your next meal is coming from. As a result, people tend to overindulge. And it's actually a place that's easy to indulge in because food is actually fairly cheap. McDonald's is doing terrific right now in the recession. Um, and it's one place that we have to remember. Um, and clearly, when there's more stress involved and obesity marketing, all of those things have some influence. And you can see that uh, mortality actually goes up when the economy is not as good. And people speculate and has a lot to do with the fact that people start to accrue unhealthy habits. Now, this is an interesting study, too, when it comes to obesity. And what these researchers did is they looked at uh, the risk of becoming obese on the basis of your friends or your family. And you can see here that if you had an obese friend, 
you've increased your risk of becoming obese 57 percent and a spouse if they were obese increased your risk of 37 percent so a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you're out with people it kind of changes your attitudes around food someone else is eating a little bit more you might eat a little bit more so all of those things come into play in increasing obesity now I'm going to show you definition of obesity here's our governor in younger days you can see her about to exit office and here is a little bit later I don't put this up to knock our governor I, I like our governor but it shows that even Mr. Universe can have some problems when it comes to weight now if we're going to define weight probably the best way to do it is body mass index and you can see here that normal is about 18 and a half to 25 overweight is 25 to 30 and obese is 30 to 35 <clears throat> and on and on the average BMI in this country is 27 so that means fully half of this country is overweight or obese now if you look at the problems that occur with obesity there are a lot of them they're literally from head to toe diabetes high blood pressure cholesterol issues joint problems all of those things occur the other thing people don't often think about is its impact on cancer so if you carry extra weight you increase your rate of cancer across the board whether it's prostate cancer whether it's breast cancer whether it's liver cancer all of them are increased in fact for men it's increased 50 percent and for women 62 percent so another thing to worry about now the other thing to consider and we often have this term called diabesity because when you're obese the risk of having diabetes is quite high and you can see here the two slides uh, the slides here show obesity on the top and here's diabetes on the bottom they look virtually the same don't they so it shows what happens when you carry that extra weight here's another slide that shows um, high blood pressure the same states that are pretty high in obesity are also very high in high blood pressure in fact if you take a look at the correlation between heart disease and obesity again they look a lot alike don't they so heart disease follows diabetes follows all with obesity and unfortunately when you carry all those extra medical problems you carry risk of mortality down below here you can see that increased risk as BMI goes up so does your risk of mortality and here is BMI of 30 so the risk really starts there and you can see here it almost goes up to three times the risk of being obese now I'm going to show you a series of slides that I think help show that this problem with obesity is relatively new okay um, and if you look this is really just going back a handful of years this is a, a series of slides that are taken from the Centers for Disease Control and pretty reputable outfit clearly and it's something called the behavioral risk factor survey surveys stayed the same over time and just to orient you to the slide you can see here that the light blue states are when obesity is very low less than 10 percent dark blue gets about 15 19 percent now let's follow and see what happens here now we get to about 1997 we've got a new color and it's uh, greater than 20 percent of that state is obese and look what happens very quickly same survey it's almost like an infectious disease in the sense of how quickly it spreads finally we have another color here's a gold color for Mississippi and in Mississippi greater than 25 percent of that state is obese I'm originally from Alabama our motto was thank God for Mississippi because otherwise we'd be last in everything uh, good and first in everything bad but unfortunately look what happened the year after Alabama joined it along with uh, West Virginia has not stopped watch keeps going even more colors continues and continues 2007 now we're looking at states that have greater than a third of its state is obese and you can really see this occurred very quickly so this was not because of genes changing this is because how we eat how we live how we work how we play how we sleep has changed and that's really what's driving this and as I mentioned a little bit earlier these trends for the adults are very kind of disturbing but the trends for the kids are actually worse it's threefold versus twofold for the adults in fact if we looked at people who have severe obesity BMI over 40 people who qualify for weight loss surgery if we put them all in one state it would be this state here the state of obesity and it'd be 12 million people that makes it larger than the state of Ohio so you can see there's a lot of people around this country that have issues when it comes to weight and it's not just the US is it you know you take a look here you can see Australia uh, England all of them have similar problems 
in, even China, a, you know, a country we don't usually think of as having a weight problem. But as we have westernization of diet, even China is having that same problem. In fact, China faces a diabetes epidemic. You know, so they're saying that about 10% of uh, China is diabetic because of obesity. The interesting thing is, if you're Asian, it's easier to become diabetic at even a lower BMI. If we keep going at the same rate in the U.S., you can take a look at this slide. By the year 2030, about half of this country will be obese. You know, it's like that movie Wall-E. If everybody ever saw it, you know, where a lot of people were obese in the movie, and we are on that trajectory right now. Now we've been witness to an uh, incredible revolution in medicine, where we've seen vaccines, open-heart surgery, uh, a lot of different devices out there. It's been just a lot of innovation over the last hundred years. And the fruits of that labor have been the fact that our life expectancy has increased. However, if we continue at these same rates of obesity, life expectancy may actually go down for the first time actually in recorded medical history. And that's all because of obesity. As you saw me mention, it really affects everything, sleep, heart, kidneys, lungs. So all of those things are at play. And let's not forget, that it does play an economic burden as well. Um, you can see here as your BMI goes up, uh, the cost uh, when it comes to health care goes up as well. Uh, I wrote a paper not too long ago where I argued that if we had kept obesity levels at 1990 levels, we'd have more than enough money to pay for health care reform. You know, so all those things that we want to do, we could do if we were able to keep our weight down. In fact, you can see here about 10 cents of every healthcare dollar is spent on obesity, and it's about $150 billion a year. Now, I want to put up this slide. You know, the White House helps drive a lot of discussion when it comes to public policy and obesity. And the slide's interesting for the fact that I've put all the different cabinet positions here to show you the impact that obesity has across the board for society. Of course, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services, that's Medicare who helps pay for treatment. Uh, the next one you can see here is the Department of Agriculture. They're the ones who decide our food policy. Department of Education, where do kids get a lot of their um, ideas about food? You know, school lunches, school breakfasts. That's where we need to start making differences. Department of Housing, there's a lot of uh, speculation that if we build our housing uh, different, you know, where we have more sidewalks, more shaded areas, people will exercise more, and if it's safer, too, in different areas. How about uh, transportation? Again, if we can figure out ways where people can walk uh, instead of driving everywhere, it'll make a difference. Uh, Department of Energy, uh, there was a study that came out that we're consuming more gasoline because of our weight. You know, our cars have to work a little bit harder. Uh, the other issue here is Department of Interior, and you're going to ask, you know, what the heck does Department of Interior have anything to do with uh, obesity? Parks, that's one, you know, where people can exercise. It's also where uh, we see the um, Indian Health Service occurring, too. And uh, our Native Americans have some of the highest rates of diabetes in this country. Department of uh, Justice, some anti-discrimination laws when it comes to obesity. Labor, again, to point out here that uh, our obese patients don't always get the job promotions they need and deserve. Uh, you can see here even further, Department of Treasury. Of course, uh, you've seen how much it costs to take care of this problem. Uh, people have speculated that it cuts into productivity. Department of State. So what does obesity have anything at all to do with uh, Department of State? You heard me mention about China, right? So all of these things are having impact around the world, where we see obesity increasing in every country. The diabetic epidemic, and of course, uh, how about Homeland Security? Anybody figure out a connection there you know, to obesity? Well, here's one. I'll tell you in one second with defense and VA. It, it looks like all of these young recruits who are coming into the Army, Navy, Coast Guard, everything else, are not fit enough to join. Okay? There was a study that came out that showed um, that's called um, Too Fat to Fight. And a lot of our, our um, young recruits who are coming in aren't able to complete, complete basic training. It's about 40%. So they've got to have basic training before they have the actual basic training. So that shows you that this can also be a national security issue as well. And let's not forget, on a human level, the psychological impact that carrying extra weight has. And I put up there a couple of so-so movies, uh, Shallow Hal, Remember the Clumps, uh, 
and they're so-so movies, um, but they point out one thing. We live in a pretty politically correct time and place where we can't make fun of a lot of different kind of people. Uh, but unfortunately right now, it looks like it's still okay to make fun of people who carry extra weight. And it has impact on our patients, and we see that each and every day. Mentioned about jobs, but there's also about colleges and things like that. And it does impact the, the care that patients need and deserve. We have a class we teach at Stanford where we teach our uh, young medical students to learn more about obesity so they're prepared to meet the challenge. Hopefully I've set the table here, if you will, for a big problem that we need to find some solutions for. And if you take a look, we've got some different things there. Uh, there's diet, there's um, behavior modification, medicine, surgery, and I'll mention a few of those right now. So these are all the different medications that you can see there. Unfortunately, each and every one of them carries some sort of side effect. Three different drugs have come up uh, to the FDA for approval over the past year, and they've not approved any of them to date. And part of it is they all carry some sort of side effect. So unfortunately right now, we're not going to see something coming out of medicines. And even if there are, take a look at some of these medicines. It may be a little hard for you guys to see, but this is the kind of weight loss that you see with the medications at the end of one year. Three kilos, five kilos, four kilos. That's on average six to 10 pounds at the end of one year. Not a whole lot. And unfortunately, you all have those side effects. Now, what about uh, plain old diet and exercise? Unfortunately, once you get to the point where you're carrying a lot of extra weight, plain old diet and exercise simply doesn't work. It fails about 95% of the time. Uh, we have better treatment programs for crack cocaine than we do for morbid obesity, and we've got to find some different things. And one thing that people often wonder is, you know, how effective is it? Remember I showed you the medications, about 6 to 10 pounds at the end of one year? We'll look at exercise alone. You can count on an entire pound at the end of one year. Diet alone will give you all of 6 pounds. Put them together, a little bit better, but not a whole lot. We're not getting very much when it comes to diet and exercise. And we're talking here about people who are morbidly obese, not just pleasantly plump, people who carry weight above BMI of 30. Why is it that diet and exercise doesn't work? Well, part of it is it's very difficult to stick to a diet. This is taken from Weight Watchers. Everybody starts out terrific. You can see they're at uh, week zero, 100% are doing it. By the end of the year, less than 10%. That correlates almost to the success rate. So what we know about diets and why they work is your ability to adhere to them. If you're able to adhere to that diet, the better your outcome. And this is taken from a study uh, that showed exactly that. And you can see the different diets there, Atkins, Zone, Ornish. Well, when it works is when you stick to it. And that's exactly what the study found. And it doesn't matter which diet is. It's your ability to stick to that diet that gives you success. Now, the other reason why people may have trouble sticking to diets is physiologic. You know, it's biologic. It's something inside of us. And there's a hunger hormone that's called ghrelin. And you can see it right there. And what happens when you diet, uh, it, let me just show you first that what this ghrelin hormone does. You can see the peaks here are correlated to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So ghrelin reminds us time to eat. And if you look at the white dots here, they're before weight loss and the black dots are after weight loss. So your body's not stupid. It knows you've lost weight. It will do everything in its power to get that weight back. So it pumps up the volume, if you will, here, and, and increases that ghrelin. Now you may ask, you know, what happens with surgery when it comes to hunger and this, and this hunger hormone? Well, remember we were looking at those, that, those um, dots before? They were up here. Well, here's ghrelin after surgery. It's virtually zero. And a lot of our patients, and we're lucky enough to have one of our patients with us here tonight, uh, will tell us a little bit about what happened to hunger after surgery. People often ask, why surgery? It's a big problem. You saw all those numbers. So shouldn't there be some public health interventions? And the answer is yes. But we've got to do something now. If we wait for public health to kind of take its course, it's going to be about you know, 18, 20 years before we see a result. What happens to that generation between now and then? It'll be lost, and we can't afford that. And so for right now, surgery will provide some sort of benefit, at least to focus attention on the issue to allow people to kind of catch up. And it's no different from other public health problems, cancer, TB, heart disease. These were all actually surgical, surgically treated diseases many, many years ago. And it's much like obesity now. Surgeons were there first, 
and we'll have everybody catch up and focus attention on the issue. Now, this is a little bit about our group back at Stanford uh, that do weight loss surgery. My partners, you can see there, we're a center of excellence. We do actually surgery on the adolescents. We do all the different procedures you see listed there. And this is our team. So the one thing I want to get across is that surgery is not a quick fix. It's a very powerful tool. Um, and we've got a lot of team members here that help you utilize that tool. All the different nurses, the nutritionists, uh, support group leaders. Now you may ask who qualifies for surgery, BMI over 40 or BMI over 35 with a serious medical problem. Now what happens after you have the surgery in terms of diet? Well your diet will change, that's kind of how all of this works. And the big thing that changes is you won't be able to have that big meal. Portions become smaller and as a result you're going to have to eat more frequently. And I keep it simple and it's simple as four by four, four small meals about four hours apart. Because of how we do the surgery, and I'll show you that in a second, you really must take your time when you eat. You have to chew about 20 times before you swallow. And it's about 30 minutes to eat. Protein is key. It's what keeps hunger away. It keeps your blood sugar from going up and down. It's that rapid change in blood sugar from high to low that gives you hunger. Protein makes that go away. It makes it nice and even. Remember what mom said, you know, when you're going out for breakfast, make sure you have a a good breakfast, get some protein in, well, she was right, and it's important that you do that. Now, the other thing that patients have to be careful of is clearly those liquids and making sure they avoid, avoid foods high in sugar and fat. And we also want to make sure patients take their vitamins each and every day. Now, people often ask, you know, is it possible for patients to regain weight after surgery? The answer is yes, if you don't follow the rules. So it's like anything else in life. If you follow the rules, things tend to work out for you. Now, the places where patients can get into trouble is if they um, don't stick to those set meal times and they nibble a little bit all day, and that catches up with you. But the key thing to do is stick to those set meal times, and patients um, will really get good results from that. You already heard me mention about the liquids. You have to be careful with those. The last point is about nighttime eating. Better to get those calories up front during the day so you have the opportunity to burn them off. If you have that big meal right before you go to sleep, very efficient way of gaining weight. Uh, it's a sumo wrestler diet. It's how they gain weight. The way I tell my patients to remember, um, a lot of my patients are female, I tell them, eat like a queen for breakfast, a princess for lunch, and a pauper for dinner. So that's the way to remember it. Now these are different procedures that we offer. You can see here the band, the sleeve, the bypass, and a newer procedure called Stoma Fix. And we do um, all kinds of approaches. This is the old-fashioned way of doing things, the uh, larger incision. We don't really do that at Stanford. 99.9% .9 of our procedures are laparoscopic, and you can see that there with the little incisions right here. Um, we are also introducing a new concept where we're able to uh, do all the surgery through the belly button. It's called single-site surgery. And we are introducing uh, the ability to do surgery all through the mouth, no sutures at all. And that's something new that's coming along as well. So let me tell you about the different procedures. One is the band, you can see here. Very simple procedure. It's a lot like having a belt around the very top of your stomach. And you can tighten up that belt or loosen it as needed. It's adjustable because there's a little balloon in there that we can blow up or let down as needed. And it's very straightforward. The other procedure we have is something called the sleeve gastrectomy. And we take uh, the stomach, which is normally about the size of a football, and make it into a long skinny tube, roughly about the size of a banana. Uh, unlike the um, band, you don't have to do worry about the adjustments, and generally there's not issues around vitamins. Now this is the gastric bypass. This is by far the most common procedure we do at Stanford and around the country. And the way it works is on two different levels. So one thing we do is we create a brand new little stomach. You can see that there. And it's uh, literally about the size of my thumb. Okay. We physically divide that away from the old stomach. Then we divide the intestine into half. And we bring one portion of the intestine up to the little stomach. Then we uh, have the other piece of the intestine joined back here. Between here and here, you don't absorb any calories. You need the juices from this part of the intestine to start that process. So that's how you lose weight with the procedure. Very small stomach, and you have a little bit of malabsorption. And that's good for weight loss, but not so good for vitamins. So anybody who has a procedure will tell you that it's important you take your vitamins each and every day. 
And of course, we do all of these procedures with the small incisions, what we call laparoscopic. And you get the same results, but much less pain, much less wound infections as well. And I already mentioned uh, we need to take those vitamins. Now, I will show you this because it's important to realize even though we do this operation through little incisions, it's still a big operation. And there's always potential for any of these complications to occur uh, later on. I do want to share with you and go over some of the safety profile of the procedure, if you will. And one thing that we found uh, when I wrote uh, this paper with one of my partners up in Oregon is one thing that really helps when you do surgery is if you do a lot of them. And that should not be any surprise to anybody. Uh, the more you do, the better you are. Uh, it's just like sports. The more swings you have at the plate, better baseball player you're going to be. Practice may not make perfect, but it's certainly going to make competent the more you do it. And we kind of showed that in this study. So we divided all the hospitals in the United States into three groups. Low volume, less than 50 a year. Medium volume, 50 to 125. And high volume, greater than 125. You can see here the complications went down just like a stepladder. See that? And that helps show that the more you do, higher volume decreases complications. We showed the same thing when it came to the adolescents or uh, young adults. When uh, we looked at the study, when we performed the study, we found that um, there was a big decrease in complications when it was done also at a high volume center. These are own results at Stanford. Done, I've done about 2,000 of these cases over time. And you can see our mortality rate is zero. And so this uh, operation can be safely accomplished. How about how it works? You already saw the figures about the weight and the medical problems, so we should take a look at how the operation addresses those. Here's the weight loss. You know, this is a, a long-term study from 10 years, and you can see here this is the gastric bypass, and it really decreases weight. It decreases it by a third. So if you happen to weigh 300 pounds, it drops your weight by 100 pounds. The banding is somewhere in between, you can see there. So it's about half of what the bypass provides. These are our own results at Stanford. About a uh, majority of our patients are BMI is close to 47 before surgery. At the end of one year, they're close to 30. These are results for young adults. This is at what we do at Lucille Packard. And you can see here that our young adults, their BMI is 55 when we start. We're talking about 15, 16, 17 year olds uh, who have high blood pressure, diabetes. We all remember how tough high school was, right? Can you imagine being in high school with diabetes and high blood pressure? Tougher for these kids, but good news at the end of a couple of years here is we see their BMI has really come down, down to a BMI of 32. Here you can see the results when it comes to getting rid of those medical problems. Take a look here. Diabetes resolves 82% of the time. No insulin, no metformin, and it's a very powerful effect that occurs within a couple of weeks after surgery. And that's really something that's very gratifying. Uh, that we see. But you can see similar improvements across the board when it comes to uh, high blood pressure as well as cholesterol issues and sleep apnea. And you can see here that the results in that study have been replicated over and over again when it comes to diabetes. And you can see that the resolution rates are anywhere between 80 to 100 percent. Also want to show you here that when you have the surgery versus not having it, it decreases your mortality. What they did is they took patients who had had surgery, compared them to people who had not had surgery, and they were equal in terms of their age, their gender, and their weight. And what they saw here was some pretty profound reductions in mortality at the end of five years. 40% decrease in mortality, 92% decrease in diabetic mortalities. All cancers decreased by 60%. Pretty powerful stuff. The only thing that we saw that where we saw the um, mortality rates go up with the surgery was around um, accidents and suicides. The one thing that binds that together is probably substance abuse. So we're very careful about warning our patients about changes after surgery so there's not a substitution for food for other things that could cause harm. In fact, we did this one study taking a look at what happened to alcohol metabolism after gastric bypass surgery. What we did is we recruited patients who had had surgery um, and we gave them glass of wine uh, before surgery and then we repeated it after surgery as well. I didn't have any problem recruiting patients for this study. Had some volunteers actually. And this is what we found. If you take a look here, 
This is their breath alcohol level with a single glass of red wine before surgery, the blue line, so 0 0.02. Here it is six months later, same patient, same glass of red wine, and you can see there that there is a definite change. It's now above that 0 0.08. So a single glass of red wine could legally, could make someone legally intoxicated, so we always warn our patients around that. Want to follow up the discussion about cost, because I mentioned that in the beginning. This is a study that shows how effective it is, and it shows that um, the effectiveness of gastric bypass surgery is less than $50,000 per life year, if you will. It's a way that economists will tell you if something is cost effective. And 50000 is supposedly the um, break-even point. And if you look at gastric bypass, it's well below that mark. Here's the 50000 and here is gastric bypass, and you can see that as the weight increases, it becomes even more cost effective, well below that 50,000 mark. In fact, when we looked at one study comparing uh, looking at gastric bypass surgery and its impact on the insurance companies, because insurance companies want you to make a business case for the procedure. I make a medical case. You saw the diabetes resolving, the mortality going down, but if they want that, we'll show it to them. And so with this study, what we saw is there's a return on investment for the surgery within two years. So all of the money that is spent on the surgery is recouped by the insurance company within two years. Now, I wouldn't be a weight loss surgeon if I didn't have some show and tell pictures, and I've got the ultimate show and tell picture here with my, my good friend, and we're gonna show you um, a little bit about the impact of the surgery. This is a, one of my patients, former high school wrestling football coach and football coach. He had had two open heart surgeries, was on three different medications for his cholesterol, still couldn't get it down and was actually in, in, in jeopardy for having another open heart surgery. So we wanted to take a look at the impact of the surgery on his cardiac risk. And what we did is we looked at certain cardiac risk factors and see what happened before and after surgery. Here's total cholesterol, and what we found is it went down by 20 points. LDL, the bad cholesterol, also went down, went from 124 to 88, went down by almost a third. Good cholesterol, HDL, we want to see go up, and it did indeed go up almost by 20%. Triglycerides, the one that was correlated with the sweet drinks at the beginning of the talk, well, after surgery went down almost by half from 141 to 92, and there's some newer cardiac risk factors. Homocysteine went down by 20%, lipoprotein went down by more than half, and then there's something called C-reactive protein, which may be the single best measure for heart disease. Anything above three is considered abnormal. If you look here, C-reactive protein showed tremendous improvement. It went from 8.2 down to 1.4, so some huge improvements there. Now, you may wonder, can kids have some cardiac risk? And this is one of my adolescent patients. You can see her there before surgery and then after surgery. Um, she's actually studying to go to medical school now, and I'm wishing her luck, and certainly will write her a letter of recommendation when the time comes around. Um, but I wanted to show you we did the same study with these young adults, similar results. We got a uh, decrease in total cholesterol, triglycerides went down, bad cholesterol went down, good cholesterol went up, and even the fasting insulin really went down. So here's insulin. Insulin's high when you're diabetic, and so before surgery, on average, these kids had an insulin level of 40. At the end of two years, it was down to five. So some very profound results. And again, the, all the other ones got better as well. Remember our high school uh, wrestling coach here? Here he is about a year later. So some pretty big improvements for him. I want to show this other picture here, one of my patients. Um, it's an interesting picture uh, because he's actually a doctor. And he's the kind of doctor who treats diabetes. Uh, he's an endocrinologist. And he came to see me because he had extra weight on board and he was also diabetic. But he was also having other issues, which was his testosterone was low. And for men, that can have a big impact in many different areas. One of them is actually heart disease. If you have low testosterone as a man, it increases your risk of heart attacks. So it got me thinking about the study, and we did it. And what we found is, as your weight goes down, and you can see that in the blue line, your testosterone goes up. In fact, it almost doubled. So some pretty interesting changes there. This is another one of my patients, and you can see there she was um, before and after surgery, very bad diabetic, was on about 80 units of insulin. Her grandmother had Alzheimer's who was also diabetic, and that's partly what led her to me. She was really worried 
about becoming uh, diabetic, further, uh, furtherly bad with her diabetes, and also uh, potentially having Alzheimer's down the road. Um, she, you can see here, she's off all her medications, but she got us thinking again about doing a study. And it's an important thing to consider because as we get older and if we carry that extra weight, the end result might be dementia, might be Alzheimer's. That's a risk factor. So we wanted to do a study that took a look at this. And previous studies have shown that if you lose weight through dieting, it may improve your cognition, your ability to think and remember. And if you control the diabetes, you get similarly good results. So you guys probably know where I'm going here. So we wanted to see if gastric bypass also improved cognition, you know, your ability to think and remember. And we looked at different things. You see them there, IQ, memory, verbal fluency. This is one of those tests. I'm not going to grade anybody. You can just see along here how the test works. So this one um, asked you to circle the number six as quickly and efficiently as possible. So it went something like this. So you were then graded on how accurate you were and how quick you were. Another one of the studies, this is called trail making. You can't lift your pencil off the paper, but you have to connect all the numbers, 1 through 25, as quickly as possible. So it looks something like that. So again, you're rewarded here for memory and being efficient. And this is another one of the tests we did. Here's what we found. Across the board, for our obese patients before surgery, their results were worse. Than, uh, than the societal norms. So they were worse than average. Now you may ask what happened, you know, six months later, we can show you here. We saw improvements across the board for all of those tests for our patients. Why? The diabetes got better, the weight came off, all of those things happened. So the end result is you not only lose weight with the procedure, but you also maybe become a little smarter too. And we'll, we'll hear about that. Now I want to point out two uh, final studies here. And this is a patient of mine who had trouble getting becoming pregnant, uh, tried uh, IVF, the in vitro fertilization, couldn't become pregnant. She had something called polycystic ovary syndrome that prevented her from becoming um, pregnant. And then about a year later, after she had had the surgery, lost the weight, she was able to become pregnant. When you carry extra weight, it makes it hard to become pregnant. And the other thing it does is it makes the pregnancy not as safe. So we did another study to show that people who've had the surgery are actually going to have safer births and more ability to have kids. Now I want to show you this, um, this final uh, group of patients here. And I operated on husband and wife and you can see them there with their kids. And here they are about a year later. So you can see some pretty big changes not only in them but in the kids too. So it got us to thinking about doing yet another study and taking this into account. You know if you have friends and family that might make you more obese, well let's think about the opposite. Maybe if you have friends and family who lose weight, maybe you'll lose weight too. And that's exactly what we found. And so we found that uh, obese adult family members actually lost weight if they had a family member who had had uh, weight loss surgery too. And we saw the same thing when it came to the kids. And you can see that with the kids, they decreased their rate of, um, of, um, of weight gain over time. You can see that there. So I'm going to finish up here, and I'm going to ask our special guest to come on up, and it's uh, Rabbi Nat Ezrae to come up and say hello. And, and this is a unique opportunity because uh, we don't often have a, a patient here together. And uh, you've heard me talk about it, but here's the real living proof, if you will. And um, our rabbi is a, a very eloquent speaker, if you've ever heard him speak, and he can tell us a little bit more about the surgery, what brought him to the surgery, and what happened before and after. Great, thank you. Thank you. I feel uh, such a gratitude to Dr. Morton uh, because I feel like I was one of those statistics. Um, I was uh, diabetic. I had high blood pressure. I had sleep apnea. I had gastrointestinal issues. When I was 42 years old, I was in the pool with my son and had chest pains. And I got out of the pool and I called my wife and she said, call 911. And I said, no way, I'm not having a heart attack. She said, call 911. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm still repenting for that. She <laughs> came home and brought me to Sequoia and they did the blood test. You had a heart attack. So I had high cardiac risk. I had procedure after procedure. The cardiologist, as I'm being wheeled out of the first procedure, says, you need to have a gastric bypass. And, you know, and I said, no, I don't. I'll do it. Because, you know, like all of you, you know, 
I did diet after diet and program after program. And I believed, I, you know, I knew the statistics, but I believed I could be that 3%, that 4%, that 5%. And I'm motivated, I'm self-aware, I'm educated, and I couldn't do it. And then I did my biggest disservice. I went and I investigated on the internet. And I said, oh my goodness, there's mortality rate, one in 200. There's complication rate, 20, 30%. No way. And so I was talking to a doctor at the synagogue. I'm a rabbi in Redwood City. And he says, you know, go talk to Dr. Morton. So I went and talked to Dr. Morton. And I said, what about the mortality rate? And he said, the mortality rate at Stanford is, for me, is zero. Well, that's interesting. Why? And what about the complication rate? And, and it let me think about it differently. I'll tell you that right after the surgery, my diabetes went away without any medication. I've not been on medication in the three years since, and I do not have diabetes. My hypertension is gone. My cholesterol is beautiful, pristine. You know, and it's, it, it hasn't, and there have been all sorts of kind of collateral benefits. Uh, I used to eat very rapidly. You can't eat rapidly. I would battle hunger. And it was a battle, and I would win most of the time. The time between the heart attack and when I had the surgery, my weight actually went down a little bit, up a little bit, down a little bit. And I was net down, but it was a battle. And every night, as the refrigerator would call, you know, I was ravenous. Because as you're deficiting, your body's saying, eat, eat, eat. I don't fight the fight with hunger anymore. And I didn't realize how much psychic energy that took out of my life. So, you know, I feel on a certain level like a poster child for the surgery. It's changed my life. It's, it's given me hope for longevity. And for all that I was on medication that was controlling numbers, and for all that I made significant lifestyle changes. You know, right after that heart attack, I exercised five, six times a week. And I had been exercising before that, but that's, you know, I, I was pretty disciplined. But the battle's a different battle now. You know, and I felt that despite all of that, I was losing the battle. I'd go to my cardiologist and, oh, your diabetes is a little high. It's not where I'd like it to be. Let's add this next medication. I was on three medications for diabetes. And it just kept creeping up and creeping up and creeping up, despite all of my best efforts and all of my exercise and all of my eating pretty well. This eliminated all of those health risks. Well, what a blessing. So for me, this is a blessing. Listen, a night out on a, a school night for my son and having a job that takes me out a lot, boy, I don't do it easily. But I would do it for this. And I would invite anyone who wants to talk about it anyone who wants to hear about it, anyone who wants to talk it through, I have time for that. Because for me, it's been life. And I would say that the biggest piece for me is I couldn't have even said the words. But I was afraid I was going to die young. And I had a real fear that I would be the one whose kids would mourn the father who died young. And I don't feel that anymore. I think I'm going to live to be a cranky old fart. <laughs> And, you know, I'm going to embarrass my daughter for years to come. <laughs> and I'm going to play ball with my son. You know, I'm going to be an old guy. And that's a great, great feeling. So I didn't even realize how much that also had a piece in my heart and soul. So uh, we did the, I, I did every study because I want to learn. I, I don't know if my cognition has gone up. But, you know, <laughs> my sermons might be getting a little better. <laughs> Um, my family watches what I model, and I exercise every day. I eat very thoughtfully. I record what I eat because I want to be aware of it. I work with somebody in terms of all of my eating issues because this is something that I really want to stay the master of. Um, my weight has been stable for the last year. My surgery was three years ago. Um, you know, I lost about 75 pounds. So, Rabbi, what was, the, um, what was the best thing about the operation afterwards, and what was the worst thing? I'd say the best thing certainly was rapid weight loss. 
you know, and watching those, you know, throwing away the old pants. The, the, by far the best thing was the elimination of the comorbidities mm -hmm. and the seeing that these things which put me at risk for another cardiac incident were gone, gone, gone. The reduction of medicine that I needed to take. So there were a lot of things that made me say hooray huzzah. Um, I would say the hardest piece, th that day after the surgery, I was saying, what the hell have I done? Because I was uncomfortable, and I was in pain, and I was nauseous, and ah, ah, ah. You know, I just hadn't really prepared myself for it. Um, other than that, you know, I, people ask, do you miss eating certain things? I don't. And I eat almost everything. There are certain things that I haven't, I've intentionally not reintroduced into my diet. But, you know, I enjoy a meal. Uh, I enjoy going out. We save a lot of money at restaurants because my <laughs> wife and I split an entree now, you know, so. We actually give our patients a little card that says you can order off the kids' menu if they yeah. need to. So. My daughter has asked me specifically not to bring that out when we're out for dinner. <laughs> she says, Abba, you're just embarrassing me right now. Because I love that little card. It's, it's pretty cute, yeah. He, as you can as you can tell, he really is a, a terrific representative for uh, the procedure and for Stanford. And he's he's been so kind to come out here tonight, as well as he's literally all over our our website, and we're grateful for it. And so, yeah. thank you for for doing all of this. And yeah. we must have some questions here. You know, I I don't know. Listen, I sharing story is an exciting thing, and especially when it's such a great story. I don't know that I walk around in a constant state of euphoria. I, I'm a pretty steady guy. Um, I would imagine that Dr. Morton could probably attest that there is a shift of attitude and emotion as people let go of fear and anxiety and health stuff. So I don't know that I'd use the word euphoria, but I would say a heightened sense of well-being and positive outlook towards life. With it, along with everything you went through before surgery, would you have characterized yourself as an optimist? Yes. I was an optimistic person, and I worked really hard on having good self-esteem along with obesity. Because mm -hmm. I know that often the two don't go together. You feel a deep sense of shame, and you feel a deep sense of, you know, what's the matter with me? And, you know, I, I, I worked on that, and I am and was an optimist, and I do and did feel good about who I was as a, as a person and a human being. Um, it's also probably a piece of how I'm wired. I do think the one thing it does is give you the sense of possible again, you know, and where there are a lot of people that feel they can't do certain things because of their weight and automatically shut themselves off from, from things that are possible. That's one thing that I really like to hear from my patients. I have a happy specialty, you know, much like the obstetra, the uh, OBGYNs have, you know, where, you know, they deliver babies. And, uh, you know, I always, you know, a lot of my patients say they have two birthdays, you know, one when they're born and one when they have the surgery because it gives them a new lease off life. Um, and a lot of times patients are grateful, of course, to get rid of the diabetes, but it's really around some of the small things too. I've had so many patients say that I can go in a restaurant and I can sit in a booth and not even think about it, or I can get on an airplane and not worry about getting that belt extender. You may go, well, those are little things. But you know what? Life is made up of a lot of those little things. So I think from what I can tell from my patients, it gives them the opportunity to do things that they want to do, spend time with their kids, uh, catch up with their kids, you know, when they're running around. So all of those things are possible. And, of course, the health benefits are, are clearly uh, very important, too. So, so any other questions? There must be some questions. We couldn't have covered it all. So the band is very uh, useful in certain populations. Um, if the BMI is less than 50, it tends to work as well as the bypass in select circumstances. But clearly, the bypass does something unique. You know, it's independent of the weight loss. And it happens within a couple of weeks of time after surgery. So um, the bypass is a very special operation. And the band doesn't deliver the same sort of diabetes resolution um, big question is, how does the bypass do it? And that's what we're actively trying to figure out. There are some hormones that are made uh, that seem to trigger that diabetes resolution. One of the new medicines called Bieta is actually based off one of those hormones. Um, so we're, this is where I said, you know, how is surgery going to help us, you know, from a public health standpoint? 
Well, it's going to focus attention, and we know this works. We just have to figure out a way where we can extend all those benefits to people, maybe without having to do all the operations. And this is one way where we figure out diabetes gets better, how, and then we can give the medicine to help. So, Yes, sir? You kind of to seem to emphasize the bypass more than the, uh, gastric, the sleeve. What's the benefits or different or attributes and deficiencies from either procedure? Well, um, it's like anything else in life, you know, there's some good things, there's some bad things with each of the procedures, and it's a, it's a balancing act. But what you can say is that um, the bypass gives you by far the most weight loss. It also gives you the best resolution of the diabetes. Um, the band has probably the least risk of all the procedures, but it probably gives the least amount of weight loss. But my feeling about it is um, it, uh, I, I would say that a operation is better than no operation at all, when it comes to carrying an extra weight, because even if you lose, you know, a modest amount with a band, it's still better than staying at that at that weight because you can go up. But there's different patient populations that'll benefit. Uh, the sleeve is useful if you can't come back for, you know, to have the adjustments like you you need with the band. Uh, there can be some intestinal issues where you can't have the bypass, so it gives you an alternative. You know, it's like anything else. You know, if you go in and you have high blood pressure, that's just not one medicine. There's a lot of different medicines that help address it. Same sort of idea here. And when you come see a bariatric surgeon like myself, we kind of figure out what works best for everybody. So, sure. I know somebody who didn't have insurance and went down to Mexico mm. and had it done for $9,500. How much would it cost if she had it here? Well, so the good news is gastric bypass, the band, and the sleeve are pretty much covered Yep, it's pretty much covered by the insurance companies. But I mean, if she didn't have insurance, if she didn't have insurance and had to pay out of pocket, it's somewhere between twenty-five to forty thousand uh, dollars. There are cash discounts apparently at Stanford. So, what if um, gastric bypass fails, person gains weight back? Is there an option for them? And I have to say, I had gastric bypass five years ago, so. Oh. I'm but I have someone who's gained weight back. So is there an option? Well, first of all, you know, congratulations on, on having the surgery. Um, there are options, you know, for people if they do regain weight. Uh, the first thing we have to do is address, you know, what's going on with diet, and we do the usual things, the food diary, meet with the nutritionist. We'll do an x-ray to see if the little stomach has gotten bigger over time. That's something else we can do. And then I show this thing called StomaFix, uh, where we're able to actually make that stomach smaller all through the mouth, so no incisions at all. And we've had some pretty good results with that to date, so that's an option out there for people. Um, there can be some other issues that come up, but, you know, a bariatric surgeon, we'd be happy to investigate and figure out what's going on. So there are options out there, even short of the traditional surgery. We can all do it all through the mouth, what they call uh, natural orifice surgery. A lot of the um, high blood pressure or high cholesterol is inherited, I think. Like my sister is the same height as I am, five, nine, five eight and a half. She weighs maybe uh, 40 pounds less. She has high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Yeah. And I have a perfect cholesterol and perfect blood pressure. So it's hereditary. So some of it is. So for high blood pressure and for cholesterol, some of it is definitely um, genetic. Uh, but, you know, if we look at those resolution rates for high blood pressure and cholesterol, a lot of it you can tell is driven by weight because high blood pressure and cholesterol gets better 70% of the time. So I'd say the genetic comp component is probably 30%, roughly. So. Yes, sir? You're, you're a proponent of the surgery, but one of the things is lifestyle. I mean, it's, I mean... I myself was 165 pounds all through high school, and a couple of years after in the college, then your lifestyle changes, your food intake changes, and even though in my adult life when I was active, yeah, I still gained weight in a stepping pr process, and still, it, it, I mean, even though I was active, exercising, and everything else, I still didn't have the the medical thing, but you're still gaining weight, right. no matter what. It's still a lifestyle. What do you do? I mean, you can have the surgery and you can act like a 
initial panacea sort of thing, but what do you do to change the lifestyle? Because that's where the real, Ab I mean, I mean absolutely. smaller portions, the two more often, to have regular intake rather than a cycle intake as which your graph showed, you know, you have breakfast and it drops, and lunch and it drops, and dinner and kind of stays the same during the evening, so well, how do you address that? Well, I would say, you know, uh, gaining weight is, is insidious. You know, it's very easy to do. You know, you, uh, when you're in high school, it's, uh, you know, you may gain a few pounds in. You go to college, you, you know, they've got buffets. You're on the meal plan. It's easy to gain weight. If you're a, a woman and you have kids, you know, you may gain maybe 50, 60 pounds in your pregnancy. You get maybe half of that off. You know, you're 30 pounds up. You have two more kids. Before you know it, you're 100 pounds overweight. And it's just, it become, it's very easy to do in this society, very easy to gain weight, very hard to keep the weight off. So I'll say that, that it is very easy for people to gain weight. This is, of course, a lifestyle change. You know, the surgery is not magic. It just helps reinforce all those good habits that we want people to have. And uh, when it comes to lifestyle changes, I think our, our special guest here can tell us a little bit more about, you know, if you want, do you want to give an example of what you what you used to maybe eat and how it changes change now? Yeah, I mean, I really plan out what I'm going to have every single day because I would eat kind of impulsively and I would eat much larger portions. So unless I've kind of planned and my wife and I prepare food beforehand, I record what I eat. I meet with a behavioralist to discuss other food triggers and behaviors and to be aware of it. I schedule my exercise so. There's a vigilance that I've needed in order yeah. to um, r retain the benefits of the surgery, um, and they've been behavioral, and uh, you know that's what it's taken. I'd say one thing that comes out of that is uh, planning is pretty important. You know, there's an old saying: if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And body likes having uh, regimentation; it likes to have a regimen, and likes to know you're going to have breakfast at 8 a.m. every morning body likes that and it likes to know when food is coming. Exercise is, is a very important component to maintaining the weight, but I'll be honest, the best way you're going to lose weight is through diet. It's really tough to exercise your, your way out of carrying a lot of extra weight. It takes um, 3,500 calories, you have to burn 3,500 calories to lose one pound. Now I think I'm pretty good on the elliptical, but if I'm doing pretty good, I'm maybe 500 calories. So, you know, it's pretty tough to exercise your way out. It's very easy to put it on. Uh, for an exa give you an example, if you keep everything else equal and you consume an extra 150 calories a day, about a soda, you'll gain 10 pounds at the end of one year. It's just one additional soda a day. How about a lifesaver? That's 10 calories. You know, if you have one lifesaver a day, keep everything else equal, and then you end up gaining one pound at the end of one year. So it's the power of the every day. So you've got to take a look at those things that you're doing each and every day and make sure that they're the good things that you're doing. So lifestyle is important, and all surgery does is help reinforce the good lifestyle. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, there was a news article about, or on the news, they showed some hypnotist hmm. that um, hypnotized someone to thinking they had gastric bypass, and then they remember the surgery, they remember the instruments, and and they start eating just like somebody who had had the surgery. Have you ever heard? I saw the report. Uh, it hasn't been published or anything like that, but I've, I've heard about it. It's interesting. I think, you know, power suggestion is, is a very powerful thing from time to time. I don't know how uh, enduring that is. I don't know how long that will last. Uh, I certainly don't think it'll be, um, you know, a, a long-term solution to this very big problem that we have. But it sounded interesting listening to the report. Yes. Along with your statistics and increase of obesity and all, did you notice a difference as far as ethics and population? I mean, from 1997 to today, I mean, we've had more Hispanics, more hmm. other groups that have a total different consumption rate, which changes those statistics. That's why I was just kind of wondering if you were showing those as to what yeah. So different ethnic groups do gain um, uh, different uh, amounts of weight, uh, you know, and you can quantify that risk in a lot of different ways. One of them is, like I mentioned, obesity and diabetes. 
If you're um, a, a white child born in the U.S., you have a risk of becoming diabetic of 33%. If you're African American, it's about 40%. If you're Latino, it's 50%. So it certainly is different, you know, depending on which um, uh, ethnicity you are. That being said, there's no ethnicity that is not increasing its weight over time. They all are, you know. So uh, it, it does one single ethnic group uh, isn't accounting for this. It's a problem that's across the board. You know, they say, you know, rising tide raises all boats. Well, we're all contributing towards this obesity epidemic. So, well, I really uh, appreciate everybody's attention. Any last questions? I think one thing we ought to do is, uh, uh, if you don't mind, give our, our special guest here a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.